Thank you so much for inviting me today and thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Um, I'm gonna start by uh, sharing with you my disclosures. Uh, they're mostly related to research funding as Lauren um, alluded to, and I also serve as a consultant and on steering committees for some of these clinical uh, trials. Uh, and I um, have founded and I'm co-owner of Reliant Black Sciences, a company focused on the development of biomarkers in IgA nephropathy, but none of this is really relevant to today's talk. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, what we're more and more referring to globally as complement-driven glomerular diseases. And I was tasked to add, answer a several questions on your behalf. Um, so what is the complement system? How does it work? How does the complement system drive rare kidney diseases? Uh, we're gonna have a brief overview of uh, research supporting the role of complement in three particular uh, diseases, IgA nephropathy, C3 glomerulopathy, and membranous nephropathy. Uh, how do I know as a patient if my rare kidney disease is caused by the complement system? And we're gonna briefly uh, discuss clinical trials ongoing with complement targeting uh, therapies. Uh, so first, let me give you a quick overview of a very complex system known as the complement system. So I label these slides as complement system 101. They're by no means, um, you know, uh, inclusive. They're just, you know, an overview of the system that's pretty complex. Um, but the complement system is part of, of what is known as the innate immune system, uh, also referred to as the non-specific immunity. And the innate immune system is pretty important. It's a defense mechanism that we're all born with. And it's the first line of defense that protects our bodies against invaders entering uh, the body. So as you can imagine, because it is uh, the first line of defense, it has to act quickly. So it has to be um, ready to launch uh, in a non-specific fashion. Uh, because it needs to protect uh, the body from immediate dangers, if you will. And as such, it has been evolutionarily conserved across multiple um, um, organisms, vertebrates, invertebrates, and plants. And that usually gives us a sense that uh, something that's evolutionarily conserved over many, many uh, moons usually means it's very important for survival. So the innate immune response is required to ultimately activate what is known as the adaptive immune response or specific immune response. And these are things that, for example, you heard about on the news quite a bit in the setting of COVID, the development of antibodies against specific pathogens. Uh, that's what's known as the adaptive immune response. And scientists have known about the complement system for quite some time. They didn't know it was the complement system at the time, but they had made important observations as early as the 1800s. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, scientists by the name of Jules Bordet, Belgian scientist, in 1890 made important observations uh, where he uh, described the protective role of the serum uh, in two folds. So he did a pretty neat experiment where he took guinea pigs and infected them with cholera. And once they survived the cholera infection, he took their serum and injected it into other guinea pigs that were sick with cholera. And he wanted to know if that conferred uh, protection against the cholera infection. And he noted that if he was uh, heating the serum, so if he took it out, heated it, and then injected it, uh, the uh, heat stable component of the serum was able to protect the guinea pigs um, that were still alive. But if he took that heated serum and put it in a petri dish with the bacteria, he couldn't kill the bacteria. So he divided the immune response into two components, the heat stable component that confers immunity or protection even when the serum is heated. And there was something else that he called a heat labile component that somehow was lost, a protective mechanism that was lost once we heated that serum. Uh, and uh, needless to say that Jules Bardet went on to win the Nobel Prize in 1919 for his work um, in, you know, in the complement system and other uh, scientific discoveries as well. Uh, so several years later, in 1899, the German immunologist, Paul Ehrlich, who also uh, went on to win a Nobel Prize in 1908 in physiology and medicine, named this heat labile component the complement. So this was the first time the word complement was introduced. And in his mind, uh, 
this was a part of the immune system that complemented the heat stable components of the immune system, which were later discovered to be antibodies. So again, they work in collaboration. They're both important in their own way, but they are uh, somewhat, uh, they have different roles. So what is the complement system? It is the group of proteins that circulate in the blood. Uh, thankfully, most of these proteins are enzymes that are in the inactive phase. And once you are faced with a danger or a pathogen or something invading your body, they get activated so they can do their job. And what that means is, let's say we have enzyme one that gets then activated and in turn activates enzyme two that gets activated and in turn activates enzyme three and so on and so forth. So you can see this is a cascade of events that ultimately leads to an immune response. And it has a domino effect, uh, which is uh, really important and can again happen very quickly. So we now know there are at least nine proteins that form the complement system. They're all designated by the letter C that stands for complement, which is easy, thank God. And then uh, they have numbers and usually the numbering is related to the sequence in which they were discovered. Regardless, once they're activated, they can break down into fragments and the fragments are labeled by A and B. So for example, if C3 is broken down, it'll uh, degrade into two fragments, C3A and C3B. Same with C5, for example, it becomes C5A and C5B and so on and so forth. And then these fragments uh, aggregate and form new proteins. For example, the C5 convertase is a bunch of complement proteins that then activate the next step and so on and so forth. There are three pathways that all converge into one terminal pathway. So the classical pathway, alternative pathway, and mannose binding or lectin pathway. And I'm gonna talk about these in a little more detail because they're relevant. They all converge and lead to a final step that's the formation of the membrane attack complex, which is quite important. And I'll talk about that as well. Again, this part of the pathway is referred to as the lytic pathway or more commonly referred to as the terminal pathway. So how do we activate this uh, complement system? Again, as I said, for the most part, it is in the inactive state until it's needed. Uh, that's not entirely true and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, but you can activate it through the classical pathway. And this part of the complement system is supposed to recognize antigen antibody complexes. Uh, so again, once these uh, immune complexes are formed, then the classical pathway is activated. Uh, the lectin pathway is activated by the presence of specific um, lectins that recognize a pattern of sugar found on the surface of specific bacteria, fungi, pathogens, things that can hurt your body. So again, we all have sugars attached to proteins even in our own body. So you don't want that system to recognize just any sugar on protein. But if it, if it sees a specific pattern of sugars, it realizes this is something that I'm only seeing that I've never seen before. It's not part of my body. I need to attack it and the lectin pathway is activated. And then the alternative pathway, this pathway is always active at the pretty low level. And then once it's faced with danger, if you will, then it gets uh, ramped up and activated uh, to, to a much higher level. So that's why I, I said the complement system is for the most part inactive except for that alternative arm. And the way it's activated is the C3B gets bound to this fragment of C C3, the complement three protein, gets bound to the surface, to the cell surface of, again, any pathogen, any foreign uh, body, and that triggers the alternative pathway to be activated. Importantly, all of these converge at the level of what's known as the C3 convertase, this very important enzyme that breaks down C3 into C3A and C3B. <clears throat> so what happens once we have the C3 convertase is formed? C3 is divi divided or broken down into C3A and C3B, as I mentioned. And C3A recruits special white cells to the site of infection or inflammation. So again, um, you have a site of attack on the body. The C3 is activated and divided into C3A and C3B. And that calls white cells to come to the site where they need to fight the infection or inflammation. Uh, how about the C3B fragment? So the other fragment that comes out when the C3 is broken down. 
C3B acts as a shooting target, if you will. It binds to the surface of a foreign pathogen, and it tells the body, I found something that shouldn't be here. Come on over and, and kill it. So this process is known as a fancy name for it is opsonization, essentially uh, targeting or, or like flagging something for the immune system to come attack it. Um, and this leads to the white cells coming to this pathogen that has been already flagged uh, to eat it up. And this process, again, from the Latin word uh, is phagocytosis, which essentially means eating of cells. Uh, uh, cells that are typically foreign to your body or pathogen, the bacteria, and so on and so forth. The next step is that the C3B also binds to other protein and forms the C3, C5 convertase, which again breaks C5 into C5A and C5B. And the C5B portion uh, combines with other proteins to form this very important um, uh, component known as the membrane attack complex or MAC for short. And the membrane attack complex is essentially a structure that looks like a little channel that gets inserted in the surface of cells and in so creates a, 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 literally a channel where substances can, can, can flow in and out of the cell and of course, that cell can then not survive because it's not protected anymore, and it will lice or break down uh, and can be killed. So this is, again, a way to protect yourself from pathogens or bacteria by creating these holes or pores in the cell surface that leads to, the, to cell death. Um, so if we put all this together, again, um, not to make it very complex, this is really a very simplistic way of looking at it. The complement system is a cascade of events. Uh, it is activated in one of three ways. The classical pathway recognizes antigen antibody complexes, so immune complexes that are floating around. The lectin pathway recognizes sugars that have a specific pattern on the surface of bacteria, fungi, so on and so forth. The alternative pathway can recognize again, pathogens or injured tissue that's tagged or at, to which the C3B is attached. They all converge on the C3 convertase, which leads to a, a series of events that then cause phagocytosis, eating up of uh, substances and, and structures that should not be there, inflammation, and cell lysis and death. Cell lysis meaning cell breakdown and death. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, this is really almost like a nuclear uh, chain reaction and you need to keep it tightly regulated. Otherwise, you can end up with an excessive uh, response uh, and inflammation and sometimes what we, what's known as anaphylaxis, for example, like an excessive inflammatory response that may be detrimental to your body. Um, so why is the membrane attack complex? As I mentioned, it allows you to kill uh, pathogens by inserting these little holes in their cell surface and then essentially bursting these cells. And uh, it is important in general, but it's important in particular uh, for a specific type of bacteria known as Neisseria species. And the reason I mentioned that is as we treat with complement inhibitors, particularly complement inhibitors that prevent the formation of the membrane attack complex completely, we really need to have patients vaccinated for Neisseria, ideally before treatment starts. But if that's not possible because they're too sick, then we treat them with antibiotic prophylaxis until we can get them vaccinated and immunized against Neisseria. Why is Neisseria so tricky? Uh, Neisseria are what we call intracellular organisms, meaning they can live inside the cell. So you can see here a very nice uh, intact cell that is studded with these bacteria, but you can see that the bacteria is also floating around outside the cell. So they can live inside and outside the cell. They're usually um, come in, in two little balls attached to each other. Uh, we sometimes refer to them as coffee bean shape uh, or uh, diplococci, which essentially means two round structures. Regardless, there are two uh, important species for humans, Neisseria meningitides, that can cause meningitis and can be quite serious and deadly, and Neisseria gonorrhea, that can cause a sexually transmitted disease. Um, so, of course, we are more concerned about Neisseria meningitides because of the consequences if you have meningitis or inflammation of the lining of the brain. So we know that genetic defects that lead to disruption of the membrane attack complex 
uh, increase the patient's susceptibility to Neisseria infection. So it comes as no surprise that if we, again, give drugs that prevent the formation of the membrane attack complex, patient's risk for meningitis goes up, but can be prevented. So it's important that we know that. Uh, so as I mentioned, the complement system has to be tightly regulated, otherwise you will be in trouble all the time. And so all these uh, substances that I, proteins that I've flagged here in red, are essentially police or stop gaps that prevent the system from being active when it doesn't need to be active, but it also prevents the system from going haywire once it's activated. So you want a prompt response, and then you should be able to shut down the system uh, when you don't need it anymore or when things are under control. Uh, and of course, if you have disruptions in some of these um, uh, stop gaps, then you can also get uh, disease. Uh, that's particularly true, for example, of the C3 glomerulopathies that I'm going to talk about. So let's shift gears and talk about these specific diseases and the role of complement in each of them. Uh, and I always uh, like to start by um, introducing what a normal kidney biopsy would look like so that you can look at disease biopsy and, and maybe it'll make a little more sense because these are, again, uh, pretty difficult structures to imagine. So kidneys are made of several components, but we're gonna to focus today on the glomeruli or what is known as the filtering units of the kidneys. And these are uh, structures like this. This is a gorgeous 3D picture of a glomerulus. And uh, we have about a million per kidney, so quite a few of them, thankfully. Uh, and they are essentially balls of blood vessels that filter the blood 24 seven. So once we biopsy a patient, we take samples of uh, the tissue that may include anywhere from 10 to 30, 40, 50 glomeruli, depending on the biopsy specimen. But uh, at least 10 is kind of what's recommended for it to be an adequate sample. And uh, the tissue is then sent to the pathologist who will slice it and dice it and stain it. And when we um, cross-sectionally or cut through this glomerulus and put the picture on a slide. This is what it looks like. So this is uh, a picture of a healthy glomerulus and you can see it's this lacy, very fine pattern uh, of uh, you know, sections of blood vessels, again, that filter the blood and the urine ultimately pools in this space known as Bowman's uh, space and then is drained out of the glomerulus. So what you should be looking at are very fine loops lined by a very fine, thin uh, layer. Uh, you should see cells, endothelial cells, that line these loops, made essentially blood vessel loops. And then in between, if you use a stain uh, to look at the, the same glomerulus, you see what's known as the mesangium. It's the structure that kind of holds these loops together. And again, the mesangium should have barely any structure to it. It should be pretty small, shouldn't be you know, large or expanded, and shouldn't have many cells either. So nothing more than three cells per mesangial area. And then again, the urine pools here and is ultimately drained by these uh, tubular structures. But today we're gonna focus on the glomeruli. So having seen a normal glomerulus, let's talk first about IgA nephropathy. So in IgA nephropathy, patients typically present with blood and protein uh, in the urine, sometimes blood alone. Uh, they're typically younger in age. So the peak diagnosis is either in childhood or in uh, patients' 20s and 30s, but you can detect it all through uh, life, of course. And when we biopsy patients with IgA nephropathy, what we see under the regular microscope, as I've um, alluded to before, this mesangial area should really be almost inconspicuous. And you can see here that it's expanded and it has too many cells, way too many uh, for, for this uh, glomerulus. So there's mesangial expansion. And when we stain this uh, mesangial uh, area, we see deposits of immunoglobulin A. It's an abnormal immunoglobulin A that's attached to an antibody as the body is trying to get rid of it. Uh, it gets stuck in the kidney. So if we then send this tissue to uh, look at it under the electron microscope, which is just a fancy microscope that can magnify the picture uh, tremendously, you can see that these are immune complexes that are sitting or trapped in the kidneys. 
Um, so what we know about the disease is, of course, in the right uh, population that has the genetic predisposition for it, uh, and under the influence of some environmental trigger, be it an infection, something in the food, we really don't know what triggers the disease, but suffice it to say, it will lead to an increased production of this abnormal IgA that has an abnormal number of sugars on it. This then is recognized as something foreign against which the body forms autoantibodies. These immune complexes then float around and sit in the kidney, they're trapped and lead to uh, kidney injury, uh, and then ultimately scarring and decline in kidney function. So we've known for quite some time now that there is uh, activation of the complement system, particularly the lectin pathway and the alternative complement uh, pathways. And so it makes sense that we would try to target those to prevent disease uh, progression. So uh, as I mentioned, there are clinical, pathologic, genetic data that confirms the involvement of the complement system, in particular, these two pathways I talked about. Uh, and it's important to know that if we stain somebody's uh, uh, renal tissue or kidney tissue, somebody who has IgA nephropathy, we will also find a lot of C3 uh, that's deposited, uh, but absent CYNQ, which again suggests that the classical pathway is not involved. And C3 can be seen in about 90% of biopsy cases, so quite often. Um, I should point out that when we look for the complement system activation, and that I think answers the question, you know, I've never heard of this, or my doctor may never have talked to me about the complement system. We really stain for just two or three complement protein, at least on routine basis, C3, C4, and C1Q. Uh, but as I showed you, the complement system is made up of many, many, many proteins. And of course, in research labs, we can stain for a bunch of them. And that helps us figure out which part of the complement system is activated. But in, on a routine basis, these are not stains that are easy to use, nor are they available. So when you look at your pathology report, you're not going to see all these fancy complement proteins that I talked about. But a lot of them can be stained for if needed. Um, so again, for IgA, the lectin pathway is important, the alternative pathway is important, so it makes sense that we would try to target them, and I've highlighted here in light blue uh, compounds or drugs that are being tested for the treatment of this disease at multiple levels of the complement system. Of course, the further down you go, uh, the more global the complement um, blocking is. So of course, if you block at the end of the pathway, the terminal pathway, you're essentially preventing, act, even if these are activated early on, they just can't get to the point where you have a membrane attack complex. So if you can get away with more specific uh, um, uh, blockers, then it may be safer. And that's part of the reason people are excited about, uh, you know, blocking just the alternative pathway, or just the lectin pathway, so on and so forth. So I'm going to focus on the few studies that are a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of development that you may hear about in the foreseeable future as potential treatments. So one such uh, drug is uh, the uh, OMS721. So again, to go back to this picture, this is binding here, preventing the lectin pathway uh, activation. It is a monoclonal antibody that inhibits this lectin binding um, protein known as MAS2, not important, uh, but uh, suffice it to say it inhibits the lectin pathway. So the phase two study randomized 12 patients to receive weekly IV, OMS721, or placebo for 12 weeks. And then they followed people for another six weeks. And at 18 weeks, if people had not responded to the drug, meaning they still had quite a bit of protein compared to when they started the study, they just they then offered them to continue on uh, open label drugs. So essentially, they gave everybody medicine and followed them for uh, 104 weeks. So this is the first part of the study. Again, a small number of patients, but the protein level dropped by about 18% in both groups. So really, there was no difference between the drug and the placebo. But when they gave uh, people drug for longer periods of time, they saw a significant drop in protein level in the urine in the order of 61%. Uh, and the GFR, or kidney function test, remained stable up to week 104. Again, this is 
a little early to comment on. Um, this was also early because of course it only involved eight patients, but it was encouraging enough that they decided to proceed with a phase three study. Uh, here again, the design is somewhat similar. They would randomize people to get IV uh, narsoplimab. So now they gave this drug a name uh, or placebo for 12 weeks. They'll figure out if patients have responded or not, and they will offer them further treatment if they had just a partial response. And then they will follow them to the end of the study, at which time they will decide uh, on whether the protein level in the urine has gone down significantly enough to be, to be relevant, and what happens to the kidney function test with time. So this is an ongoing trial. The other clinical trial is looking at LNP023, and this is an orally available small molecule that inhibits factor B, one of the most potent uh, um, activator of the alternative complement pathway. Uh, in the phase two study, again, they randomized people, meaning they assigned them to either get placebo or get real drug, and the drug was tested at multiple doses to see which dose was the best. Patients included uh, had to have preserved kidney function with the GFR over 30, and they had to have significant protein, which put them at risk of disease progression. So, of course, we don't want to treat um, patients that were going to do well regardless uh, with these, uh, you know, uh, immunosuppressive drugs. We want to select the patients that are likely to progress with time. Uh, so it's worth giving them an immunosuppressive drug. And uh, what they showed, and I'm cutting off here part of the title, but the, is that the um, proteinuria or the protein level uh, in the urine continued to decline, uh, not only at three months, but also at six months. And I'm showing you here the six month data. And you can see that the lower the dose, so the dose is here on the X axis, the, in the low dose, really the decline in protein level was not a whole lot. And as you escalated the dose, the effect on the protein in the urine became more pronounced. So at 200 twice a day, the protein level in the urine declined by somewhere between 28 to 40%. So again, a substantial drop in uh, protein in the urine. So with that encouraging data, they moved on to the phase three trial known as the applause IgAN trial, which is ongoing. They're looking for patients that have IgA nephropathy, 450 of them uh, all around the globe. They have to have a kidney function of 30 and above. Uh, if, you know, and the, the timing of the biopsy changes for these two groups. Uh, but suffice it to say, they will receive either placebo or 200 milligram twice a day. And we will follow uh, with time to see what happens to the urine protein to creatine ratio at nine months and what happens to the kidney function over 24 months or two years. Uh, interestingly, they um, decided to include a group of patients, really small group of patients that have advanced kidney disease, a GFR between 20 and less than 30. Uh, and that's what we call an exploratory um, uh, group, meaning we're trying to explore if it is worth treating people that have very advanced kidney disease where the disease could be irreversible. We really don't know. Uh, we think it may be irreversible, but perhaps if we treat these patients, we can again extend the life of their kidneys. So that was the whole purpose of adding this extra group. And we also have to determine the safety of using these drugs in that um, uh, group of patients. Uh, so how about the C3 convertase um, inhibitors? So again, I told you C3 convertase is this um, important conversion point of all these complement pathways. <clears throat> APL2 or uh, pexetacoplan binds to C3 and inhibits its cleavage or breakdown into C3A and C3B. Because it is pegylated, it's you know, formulated uh, such that it has a longer lasting effect, meaning you get less in, uh, infusions or injections, uh, which is of course important to patients. So in this phase two trial, uh, that included patients with IgA nephropathy, but also other diseases, including C3G and primary membranous nephropathy that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, they assigned patients uh, to get drug for 16 weeks. They had 21 patients. Uh, the IgA patients in particular had to have a GFR or kidney function over 30 uh, and urine protein of more than 700 milligrams 
program on a 24 hour urine collection. So you see the common theme, everybody needs to have relatively preserved kidney function and protein in the urine. And they followed uh, them. And again, here, the protein level uh, was reduced by 50% uh, from baseline to week 48. And that study has completed recruitment, but there's no yet results that are either available um, publicly or uh, no uh, plans for uh, the second phase or phase three of uh, trial um, that has been again shared with the public yet. So let's shift gears and talk about C3 glomerulopathy. These are rare glomerular diseases that result from a dysregulation in the alternative uh, complement pathway. I'm sorry for the typo, this is alternative complement pathway. And uh, these are either mediated by genetic mutations or acquired defects of the alternative complement pathway. And they're classified into two diseases, C3 glomerulonephritis, so C3GN. I know it may be a little confusing. So C3G is this umbrella that covers two diseases, C3GN and dense deposit disease. Dense deposit disease we tend to see in children. C3G we see in young adults, teenage patients, all the way to young adulthood, but we can see it again later on in life. Um, Importantly, when you do uh, biopsies on these patients, you see complement, the presence of complement on the tissue, and I'm going to show you pictures of that, uh, but there's no like immune complexes in this uh, real sense of the word like I showed you in IgA nephropathy. Uh, it is uh, prevalent, its prevalence is estimated at two to three cases per million in the United States, and males and females are usually equally affected. And patients typically present with blood and protein in the urine as well. So this is what a biopsy would look like. So you can see compared to the normal glomerulus that I showed you early, uh, this is a really busy glomerulus. It has tons of cells that should not be there. You can't even see these loops that should be pretty fine and open, like these would look pretty good. And then here you would uh, see that you can't even see an open loop. So you can easily imagine how this glomerulus would not be able to effectively filter the blood. When you stain it with immunofluorescence for complement three or C3, you see significant staining. And that's typically the only staining that you see. And there's really no immune complexes when you see, uh, look at them uh, under this fancy electron microscope uh, in the glomerulus. On the other hand, uh, dense deposit disease, again, stains for C3. This is of course an extreme case, but you can see that the staining here uh, so here the staining is disrupted. It's almost like uh, blotchy, but if you go to the dense deposit disease, it's continuous, it's almost like a ribbon. And in fact, under the electron microscope, you see this dark black ribbon that lines the basement membrane, uh, which gives it the name of dense deposit disease. It's essentially a description of what pathologists see under the microscope. Uh, the treatment has focused, of course, on the complement system since it's the initial um, trigger for the disease. And uh, approved complement targeting therapies uh, such as eculizumab or revolizumab, so the commercial names for those are Solaris and Altomeris, which you may have heard about, um, have been tried. And they are antibodies that bind C5 and therefore really block the terminal part or the uh, last part of the complement cascade. Again, as I mentioned, these uh, may increase your risk of uh, meningitis. So you have to be vaccinated in preparation for the treatment. Uh, and usually there's enough time to vaccinate people. But if the disease is very aggressive and you're having to start the treatment immediately, then you can take antibiotic prophylaxis and then get vaccinated in the meantime uh, while you're getting treatment. The results with these treatments were not very consistent. And so that, again, uh, led to interest in testing more therapies, and in particular therapies that block the alternative complement cascade would make sense, or uh, things that are further down the pathway. So uh, you will notice that some of these drugs uh, sound now familiar. They're being tested in multiple uh, diseases. So LNP023, uh, I've talked about for IgA, APL2, APL2 has also been tested in IgA, and of course, it's being tested now for C3G. And I'll talk about avacopan in a minute. Um, it's worth mentioning that the factor D inhibitors sounded also attractive. It blocks the alternative complement cascade. It's been tested in a study 
in a phase two study. And unfortunately, the study had to be stopped because the, uh, we didn't see the results we were hoping for. In part, there were questions whether patients were taking their drug consistently because it's an oral therapy. But importantly, that we could not, the drug could not block the alternative pathway fully like it was uh, supposed to. So it may be just a dosing issue and not really a failure of the drug. So this may come back and be tested in a different formulation in the future. So how about the uh, LNP023? <clears throat> Again, this is a drug that blocks factor B and therefore inhibits the alternative complement cascade. Importantly in this trial, what they did is they took patients that have C3G in their native kidneys or patients that develop C3G a recurrence after they got the transplant. And uh, that's really important because of course, if you have a disease that comes back after transplant while you're on a bunch of immunosuppression, that means you know, you're clearly not responding to all the immunosuppressive drugs you're already on. And that can be very frustrating to patients and uh, treating physicians. So they did a kidney biopsy at the study entry, and then patients were started on a drug, and the dose was escalated to this 200 milligram twice a day. That seems to be the best kind of dosing while being safe. And then patients, uh, importantly, had a repeat kidney biopsy to look uh, whether we were able to prevent the complement activation at the level of the tissue. And then they were followed, of course, for some time. So you can see here that with Iptacopan, so LNP023 has now a name and it's called Iptacopan. Uh, you can see that patients with C3 that started with protein in the urine on average about one gram per day had a decline in protein uh, levels uh, quite nicely uh, in about, uh, of about 80%. Uh, but importantly, if you look at tissue biopsy and you can see here, uh, C3 deposition score, that's a fancy score to look at how much C3 is deposited in the kidney. This is the baseline biopsy of the patient. This is at 12 week of treatment. And you can see that there is quite a nice clearance or removal of C3 uh, from uh, the tissue, which is again, very exciting. Uh, so talking about another treatment trial, Avacopan. Uh, Avacopan is, uh, the, I'm gonna go back for a second, is this drug here. Again, the initial name for it was CCX168, but has now been approved to be used in other disorder like vasculitis um, that involve the kidneys. And so now it's the name for it is a vacopan. And so um, again, they took patients that were older than 12 years of age, had biopsy proven C3G, pre-transplant, post-transplant, and they have randomized them to receive either placebo or avacopan, 30 milligram twice a day. And they're ultimately gonna look at the change in disease activity on pathology. So again, doing biopsy before and after, which is pretty important. Uh, so in this particular trial, they announced uh, preliminary results in December of 2020. And unfortunately here, the disease activity score in the avacopan group, which is in the orange, although it looked better, it really was not statistically significantly different from uh, the groups that received placebo. Um, it may be that we didn't have enough patients, hard to say, but regardless, it didn't meet the criteria that the researchers were looking for. And therefore at that time, they announced that there'll be no additional clinical development at the present time. Uh, whether that changes in the future, I don't know. Uh, finally, the APL2 uh, that again binds to C3 and inhibits the breakdown of C3 into C3A and C3B. It's a subcutaneous injection uh, administered twice a week. As I mentioned, uh, it is a long acting drug, so you can uh, you know, get away with it without giving it daily. The entry criteria as described before, these are patients with protein in the urine and preserved kidney function. And the primary outcome that they were looking for is change in the protein level. And again, small number of patients, I mean, these are, as I mentioned, really rare diseases, two to three per million. So you can imagine it's hard to find them, but um, eight patients, uh, and for the most part, they all had a decline in the protein level in the urine. But you can see, for example, patient eight here in the gray really didn't respond. If anything, his protein level went up. Uh, but on average, in aggregate, the protein uh, level in the urine 
uh, looked pretty encouraging uh, and dropped significantly with treatment. So with that, they embarked on a phase three trial that they call the Valiant trial that is still ongoing and recruiting patients and hopefully will give us more answers. Um, so last but not least, we're gonna talk about membranous nephropathy. Uh, membranous nephropathy is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in adults. And nephrotic syndrome is essentially a constellation of signs and lab abnormalities uh, that describe just a severe disease leaking a lot of protein in the urine. And patients typically present with body swelling. It can be just in the legs or feet, but it can be uh, you know, more diffuse all over the body. And the labs will show a significant amount of protein leaking in the urine, maybe uh, it's usually more than three and a half grams, could be five, could be 10, uh, depending on the disease severity. Uh, the serum protein is low and patients develop high levels of cholesterol and triglycerides, so what we call hyperlipidemia. So that constellation of findings we refer to uh, in nephrology as the nephrotic syndrome. Uh, annual incidence is 10 to 12 per million in North America. In about 80% of cases, there's no underlying uh, cause for it. So it's what we refer to as primary membranous nephropathy. And in 20% of cases, there are other causes, lupus, uh, so other autoimmune diseases like lupus, hepatitis B, or other chronic infections and occasionally cancers as well. So we're gonna focus on the primary uh, cases. And in most of those cases, the uh, disease has been now shown to be related to an antibody that attacks a specific protein on the surface of, uh, or in the glomerulus on the, on the cells that form this glomerular basement membrane. And that protein is known as phospholipase A2 receptor or PLA2R for short that you may have heard about. So what does it look like under the microscope? Again, here is a glomerulus and you can see that the loops are relatively open, but the lining of these loops is pretty thick. You can almost, uh, you know, it's almost like somebody took a marker and made them thicker than they should be. And under the, uh, if you stain it uh, with immunofluorescence, you'll find IgG and C3. Uh, C1Q is typically absent. And if you look at the electron microscope, you can see that the membrane is studded with immune uh, complexes seen here, all these dark spots. And uh, the membrane in trying to engulf these immune complexes uh, forms, you know, lays down new material and it becomes really, really thick. So again, you see how thick it is. And that's what you're seeing under the regular microscope. Um, so complement proteins are highly expressed in the glomeruli and interestingly, even can exceed the expression of this PLA2R. So this protein that triggers, that's exposed, that triggers the disease, you find more complement protein than you find uh, this, uh, this protein. So the thought is that perhaps the injury, of course, is triggered by the immune complex formation, but that ultimately the complement activation takes a life of its own and persist way after the antibody injury results. So even if you treat the antibody uh, injury. And in fact, when we treat patients even successfully and the antibody against the PLA2R resolves, we still see protein in the urine for many, many months after the fact, suggesting that there is something that either sustained this injury and perhaps that something is the complement system. So uh, for membranous nephropathy, all three pathways are involved in the disease uh, pathogenesis and, and severity. Uh, perhaps they're activated at different stages of the disease. Uh, it's less clear. The science uh, about this is still pretty recent. So um, this is essentially what happens. Like I said, the, the cells that line these nice little loops are called podocytes. They're just special cells. And they have in the blue here, a protein that's normally present, but somehow gets exposed and the body all of a sudden sees it and thinks it's a foreign uh, body. So the antigen is this PLA2R receptor against which we then start forming antibodies that come and attach to the podocyte. And once that happens, as you can imagine, the complement system is activated. And among other things, you have this membrane attack complex that forms. Of course, this is a great system when you're trying to get rid of uh, cells that are either foreign or bacteria or so on and so forth. 
but you don't want to destroy your podocyte, but that's exactly what happens. These uh, pores get uh, inserted into this podocyte and the podocyte loses its shape and ultimately disintegrate and can be lost. Uh, that's part of the story and the other complement cascades are also involved. So um, the uh, treatment trials targeting complements in membrane cephalopathy are much more recent and much more limited. Uh, but here again, uh, the same drugs that I've showed you before are being tested in membrane cephalopathy to try to block the alternative or the lectin pathway. And there is a new drug uh, targeting factor D. Uh, as I mentioned, factor uh, D inhibition would inhibit, again, the alternative complement pathway. Uh, so the, the other uh, two trials I mentioned already, these were trials that included IgA, membranous, C3G, kind of this hodgepodge of diseases that we call complement-driven uh, kidney diseases at this point in time. So I'm just going to talk about BX9930, uh, which is a factor D inhibitor. Uh, it is uh, it started a recent uh, trial, open label, which basically means uh, you know that you're getting drug. There is no placebo arm. Uh, and they're testing uh, the drug at the different doses. They really want to know, will it be able to change the amount of protein that's leaking in the urine at week 24? And importantly, is it safe and tolerated? Um, the other, the LNP023, this alternative complement pathway inhibitor that I've been talking about is also being tested uh, in, against the standard of care, which is considered uh, rituximab, uh, which is an, um, an infusion that inhibits the formation of autoantibodies against this PLA2R. So everybody gets treatment, but patients get either rituximab alone or LNP023. And the idea is to compare those side by side to see if there is a difference or if one is superior to the other. Again, the outcome they're looking at is a change in protein uh, in both groups at the end of 24 weeks or about six months. Uh, OMS721, we've talked about before, uh, inhibits the lectin pathway, open label study, everybody's getting drug, and they're looking for the proportion of patients that can tolerate uh, the, the drug without adverse events and show a decline in protein in the urine. And so with that, I know this is a very complex system, and I hope I, you know, like simplified it uh, enough to make it understandable. Uh, but um, just to know that the role of uh, the complement system in glomerular diseases is being elucidated. This is relatively recent uh, data that we're now, you know, turning our attention to. And the fact that we have available targeted complement inhibitors make them very attractive treatment options. Again, we want to give enough drug to control the disease without causing problems to uh, patients, especially when it comes to infections. Uh, and the complement inhibitors will add to the armamentarium of treatments that are being rolled out to fight glomerular diseases. So I think in the future, they're going to be very important, maybe used in combination with other drugs as well. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizik. Um, that was amazing. I, I just learned so much and I really appreciate you putting that together for us. Um, please, if you have questions for Dr. Rizik, enter them into the Q&A. You can also enter them into the chat. Um, but while we wait for people to kind of warm up their typing fingers, mm -hmm. I do have a couple of questions I'd love to ask sure. you. Um, I have so many actually, so I'll try to trim them down. Um, there are so many trials going on right now for um, disorders of the complement system. And thank you so much for going through, you know, some of them. I think by our count, there are um, 21 drug trials for just IgA nephropathy alone. Um, and, and I, and, you know, even more for C3GN and MN, as you mentioned. Um, so I have, I really have two questions. One is, are all of these drugs immunosuppressants or how could you like broadly group, um, you know, how these drugs differ from, um, well, just that, how, are they all immunosuppressants or, or how might you sort of really roughly categorize them? Sure. And but, Lauren, but are you talking about the complement inhibitors alone or about all sorts of drugs being tested? 
Mm, all of the drugs being tested really i see Mm -hmm. yeah so if we look at globally at all the drugs being tested let's take iga for an example because it's probably the disease that's being the most um Mm -hmm. that has the most treatment trials and not all drugs are immunosuppressive drugs so some of them are thought to uh inhibit kind of uh, uh either um damage or inflammatory reactions that happen in the glomerulus that uh, after the uh, all of these diseases are thought to be in, at some level autoimmune diseases or at least mm-hmm. in, involve the immune system having said that at some point in time you trigger inflammation and there is a scarring process that happens and it becomes a snowball and so some of the drugs being tested for example endothelial inhibitors are not thought to affect the immune system uh, mm-hmm. And that's important to know because when I sit with my patients and I decide, um, you know, like which drug to give or to include, uh, you know, which patient to put in what trial, so on and so forth, especially if there are more than one available, I take into account several uh, things, including the immunosuppressive properties of the drug. So somebody that's really susceptible to infection or really just concerned about infection. Uh, or has specific family circumstances where they're worried they, if they get infected, they may affect another family member, so on and so forth. So we take all that into account. And for them, maybe an immunosuppressive drug may not be the answer. Uh, I also think about the stage of the disease. Is this a disease that just started and is very immunogenic, presumably because the trigger is just starting now? Or is that somebody that has had the disease for 10, 15 years and is now seeing kind of the tail end of the damage? Uh, And because I may approach these uh, differently. And finally, I look at, of course, inclusion exclusion criteria. There's always a little bit of a difference. Some studies require recent biopsies, especially drugs that are targeting the immune system. They want to know that there is really just still an active immunologic component to the disease because otherwise the drug may not work and may not really be for you. So they may require that the biopsy is done within five years or three years or one year, depending. Or they may say, uh, you know, it's best that you have a repeat biopsy before you engage in a study. Um, And what can the patient commit to in terms of um, treatment engagement? So if it's an infusion and the patient lives three hours away and says, I'm not coming to have an infusion once a month, that's probably not the right treatment trial for you. Even if medically it's the best one, if you're not going to stick with it, um, you might as well not participate in it because the other uh, thing to keep in mind is if you participate and cannot uh, stick with the program, then you're not only not benefiting yourself, but you're potentially harming other participants in the study. And that the treatment failure will be counted whether the patient couldn't come to the site to have their procedures done or uh, whether they came and did not respond. These are counted equally. Uh, and so it's important for people to know that their responsibilities. Um, Of course, there is a huge responsibility on the investigator, but the patient's responsibility is not only towards themselves, but also towards other participants in that study. So that's how I think about it. And and some people will say, you know, I'm not good at taking pills, so I want to get an infusion. Okay, perfect. Or vice versa. I'm scared of needles. I'll never come for an infusion. Okay, then let's look at drugs that are, you know, oral drugs and so on and so forth. But they're not all immunosuppressive drugs. All the complement inhibitors that I uh, talked about today are all considered immunosuppressive at some level, yes. Mm. But we're not seeing so far, and again, we're really early, but we're not seeing uh, significant infectious complications that are unmanageable, uh, which, is, which is great. So that has allowed us, of course, to push the envelope and continue testing these, mm-hmm. these drugs. That's so great. And you answered the second part of my question, which was <laughs> how, because our policy at NAFTA really, and I don't know if you agree, Dr. Rizik, but our policy is really, um, your doctor should at least be offering you information about these clinical trials or new treatments as they are coming out, um, because there's so much happening right now that we really have to you know, engage all patients in this incredible wave of research that's happening. We have to learn more. We have to, you know, know what treatments will help um, which patients. And so I think you already answered a lot of, you know, how do I know as a patient, you know, what trial is right for me? There's almost 40 trials overall in glomerular diseases right now. And so I think you 
really spoke to that. Um, and I think that, you know, to the patients listening, if your doctor isn't speaking with you about these trials, the way Dr. Rizik just said, you know, think about these questions. Let me talk with the patient about what is right for them. Um, we have a list of physicians on kidneyhealthgateway.com and a list of all of the trials, all 40 of the trials. So you can learn more about um, what trials are out there. And also we can help you find a physician like Dr. Rizik who will help you get connected to these clinical trials and new treatments. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And, and be your own advocate. I mean, I don't, you know, a lot of times I don't think that the physician doesn't want to refer you. They may not have anything locally that's going on. They may have to refer you to, uh, or you reach out to another institution. So if you hear or see something and you want more information, seek it and then share it with your doctor and say, is this something that may be good for me? Will it be okay, you know, for you to share my information with X, Y, and Z? Uh, there's really no harm or shame in that. I mean, uh, again, when you talk about 40 trials and a physician that has many other patients that have many other diseases, it's really hard to keep up with. So uh, we, I have the luxury of running the glomerular disease clinic. So that's my focus day in and day out, but that's not always the case for colleagues. So I do appreciate the fact that sometimes they are, you know, they, they overlook things. Um, and I tell patients, be your own advocate, and but also be willing to listen to the answer. If they say that's not a good treatment for you or not a good trial for you, well, there's probably a reasoning behind it. Um, so we do need to engage patients. The more we talk about research and we demystify it, the more people are willing and don't think of it as a guinea pig uh, experiment because it's not. But if we don't seize the moment and enroll enough and reach the goal, so all these trials calculate how many patients they need to really get a good conclusion, an important conclusion. And if they fall short of their enrollment, then we've all lost because we've dedicated time and effort. Patients have put their lives at risk and we end up with no answer essentially because we you know, don't know if the data is enough or not enough. And that, that'll be a shame. Absolutely. So we have a question from Samuel Kuo. Do you know anything about PGN-MID and daratumumab, <laughs> and will that work against C3G and PGN-MID? Uh, this is, uh, so I'm assuming you're talking about the monoclonal driven disease uh, and uh, possibly, again, these are very rare diseases. Um, but I think there are uh, potential teams that are being tested out there. So I would say yes. And we can uh, personally here locally, we are not participating or trying to, to, to use um, these drugs. But I know some people are out there uh, and we can maybe connect offline or through an F cure uh, and, and answer specific uh, questions. But um, yes, there are treatments out there being tested. Yes, we'll find out more about that. Um, another question is, how can we simplify education to patients and their families? And this is related to something else that I wanted to ask you, Dr. Rizik, as well, um, which is that all of these trials talk about lowering proteinuria. And, and that is um, really important for NEFCARE for our patients to understand. We don't know that it's talked about enough that lowering your proteinuria is really the most effective thing that you can do to um, maintain your kidneys and, and prolong the life of your kidneys. But um, we'd love to know, obviously, your thoughts about that. So uh, this is a great question, and, and uh, it's even more complex. I, I can tell you, I really, like, just to prepare this talk today, I, I kept revising and revising the slide. Lauren knows I sent them yesterday, I think. Because simplifying these complex concepts is a lot for patients. So we've been trying to, uh, you know, again, partnering with great organizations like NEFCURE, like the IGAN Foundation for the IGA nephropathy, uh, or, you know, specific uh, disease um, um, patient partners, essentially. We've been trying to get the word out there and uh, explain what the patients need to look, look for when they look at their labs and so on and so forth, again, to be engaged. Some of these educational materials are available. I think they're even on some of these organizations' YouTube channels, so you can go and just listen to them. Um, but but 
you need to know when you're looking at your labs what you're looking at and what that means. Um, but there are so many nuances that can honestly not be simplified. So I always encourage um, you have to trust your doctor and you have to have a discussion with your doctor about these labs um, because they, they have some variations that may or may not be significant. Um, they may differ on different days. If you're sick, they may, you know, the protein may go up transiently, that may not mean much, so on and so forth. And then, of course, we focus on protein because we know the most about it, but there are diseases where we see a lot of inflammation and really not much protein, but they can also be aggressive diseases. So it has to be put in context. Uh, when patients have access to their portals now, so they see the labs more frequently, they can see trends in their labs, which I think has helped. Uh, we're trying to develop printed material that explains some of these concepts. So at least because I know in clinic, we throw a lot at you in a short period of time. So it's important to also have educational material to give to patients and, you know, uh, they, so they can go home, think about them and then come back to clinic with questions. Uh, I think the basis of all this is really engagement on both ends, patients and provider and trust. Um, and, and together we can change the world. And I, I, that's so great. I think, um, I just want to reiterate something that you said at the beginning, which was, you know, become your own advocate and educate yourself and, and have information, you know, be ready for a discussion and, and have a two-way conversation about things that are happening. And, um, that's, that's really our goal as well at NEFCARE is to help, um, empower patients and, and educate them. Um, I just threw in the chat a NEFQ resource on understanding your lab values. I, I totally agree. This is one of our most popular um, resources mm -hmm. to help patients. So um, we thank you so much. Um, if anyone else has any further questions, um, I think that I think that that concludes our session. Then, Doctor Rizik. Thank you so much. Um, this has been incredible. We really appreciate your time. And I, I know that um, taking the complicated information, your research and making it accessible for a lay community is very, uh, very complicated. So we really appreciate you but going through good. this. So it's if wonderful. you have feedback or the attendees have feedback, you know, I'm more than happy to take that because it is, uh, again, it is sometimes hard to simplify these, uh, these uh, concepts and what may seem simple to me may not really be that simple. So let me know. Uh, I, I'd love to, if you hear any feedback, I welcome that. I have a thick skin too. I, <laughs> no worries. So no, this I'll has been wonderful. Well, you have a great day. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day.